Why don't we try that out there, Nikki? You volunteering? I'm not volunteering. You want to play this game? Bop yourself on the head, girl. <laughs> Of all the games Nintendo could have added to its online service, never in my wildest dreams did I expect to see Joe and Mac. Yeah, big applause. Yeah, it's no Earthbound. But Joe and Mac is a strong contender for any curated library of Super Nintendo classics. Joe and Mac isn't quite smooth enough to fit in as a Mario-style platformer, and it's not quite enemy-centric enough to be a Battletoads or Double Dragon-style beat-em-up, but the way it balances between these concepts is part of what creates the game's unique identity. Coupling this with being one of the first Super Nintendo games to sport a two-player mode where players can actually hit each other, and the image of the first level where you cuck your friend after taking out a T-Rex will forever be burned into the memory of most Super Nintendo fans. After playing the arcade version, you can see how the game would have been improved by including a couple more of the bosses from Caveman Ninja, the ability to charge up power-ups, the inclusion of the Fire Breath and other self abilities from the arcade version, or even some new Super Nintendo exclusive bosses or power-ups would have helped to add a bit more replayability. The arcade version also has diverging paths and multiple endings, to an extent, and while the Super Nintendo version's diverging paths are represented merely by locked away bonus levels that require a key, the journey to obtain said key is much more enthralling than the actual diverging paths of the arcade version. There are six keys for seven gates, which for a math enthusiast should already pose a clear quandary, but on top of that, the red eggs that drop said keys are contextual. They require you to complete a set objective like hitting them from a ridiculous angle, clearing the enemies, or stopping a geyser of water, which feels like an Olympian feat in two-player mode. There is no room for error. If you don't perfectly curve your jump, if you go too far past the egg, if it accidentally comes on screen because your friend moved a pixel too far and you had a projectile already hurtling its way because there were other enemies, you don't get the key, meaning that you get less bonus levels and ultimately less lives and health to get you through the hordes of enemies and massive bosses at the end of each level. It really is one of the more unique aspects that every level in this game ends with a monolithic, beautifully rendered boss. The T-Rex from the opening level, Pteranodons, swarms of ichthyosaurs, Audrey 2, Dylan's Rolling Western, among other incredibly unique ideas which I won't spoil. I may have complained that it was fewer than the arcade game, but almost all of the bosses are memorable for their cartoony characteristics, distinctive attack patterns, and resplendent and sprite work. Almost. And cartoony is the key word here, folks. Oh yeah, I gotta give Timmy's a good plug. The best thing you guys ever did is make those real egg sandwiches. This was 1991, the same year the Super Nintendo came out. This was two years before Aladdin looked like this, three years before Donkey Kong looked like this, and five years before Mario looked like this, and yet the game's graphics are routinely praised to this day. The characters in-game are reactive and expressive in ways that even some modern franchises aren't. The screen is always busy with life. It's a Get that cat off my head. And with the colorful, detailed sprite work, it's almost always visually captivating. But it's fortuitous that this game's art style and sound effects are so charming, because its controls certainly aren't. I've always been of the mind that not every game needs to feel the same as Mario, and certainly there's a lot of satisfaction to be had between the spin moves, the abundance of abilities, and the character interaction in the two-player super mode. However, if you'll indulge me for a minute, I'd like to give a brief breakdown of why jumping in this game is often described as floating. Mario feels satisfying to control because those games give you a clear understanding of your weight and momentum in each of your jumps through the principle of inertia. The animations and movements you have on the ground synchronize with and communicate the speed and distance of your jumps, which gives you an understanding of how far backwards you can recalculate when you overshoot them. Joe and Mac only uses the same principle of inertia once you're already in the air. It's completely disconnected from the movement on the ground, which has no horizontal momentum. You stop on a dime. Your brain then assumes, based on your lack of momentum on the ground, that there won't be any pushback once you're in the air, causing you to overcalculate where you think you'll land. It takes a bit of getting used to, but honestly it's nowhere near game-breaking, and it wouldn't be impactful enough even to complain about if it weren't for the fact that one of the last levels has a series of really specific jumps. At that point, near the end of the game, it goes from being an inevitability of a game from a company known for good but unpolished games, to being the difference between when I beat the game with 10 extra lives, versus when 
I beat the game on my last life only two days later. Even still, the level design normally foregoes strict platforming challenges in favor of playing to the game's strong suits of interacting with enemies and environments, and that, coupled with the game's length overall, helps to mitigate the lack of polish. For a Mac fanatic like myself, the game clocks in at around an hour, which is the perfect length of time for its widely celebrated two-player modes. Regular two-player mode is both you and a friend going through levels together, and two-player super mode lets you jump on each other's heads and hit each other. Obviously, any game with a two-player mode inherently has more replayability, but Joe and Mac letting you pick whether or not there's physicality between the two players is the pre-game decision of whether you aren't able to hit each other to preserve your health, or if you want the trade-off of being able to jump on each other's heads to reach otherwise unattainable bonuses at the cost of potentially hitting each other and costing health. It sounds simple, but it adds so much both to replayability and player agency, and gives way to a two-player experience that rivals the likes of Battletoads. In the endlessly enjoyable sea of Super Nintendo games, this key feature pushes the game far beyond the rank and file. Combine that with its vivid cartoonish art style and feeling of grandeur when taking down each of the bosses, it all culminates into a timeless experience that, even if it weren't free with the Nintendo Switch Online service, I couldn't recommend it emphatically enough. Final verdict for Joe and Mac, the boys gave it 4 out of 5, and the girls gave it 4 out of 5. Imagine if Claymates has put on this thing. I know! Like, like I would never need another console again <laughs> if they just put Claymates on this. Four to six weeks later.